Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here, and in this lecture we're going to be providing an overview of HTML. In this lecture, like most of the other lectures that we cover in this course, I'm going to be providing some recommended readings for you to go through. These recommended readings are all sourced from developer.mozilla.org, and they provide you a way to read through this content if you prefer to read versus listening to this lecture, for example. I recommend that even if you're more of a, uh, a person who learns from listening to lectures rather than reading content, I still encourage you to go take a look at these readings because there are some interactive coding exercises that will really help solidify some of the concepts that we discuss in the lectures together. So let's get started. What is HTML? Well, HTML is what's referred to as a markup language because it takes a document, like something that you would write with a typewriter as an example, and it marks it up and says things about how you would want to, in an ideal world, take that document and apply structure to it so that it's visually pleasing or laid out in a way that improves uh, its readability and so on. So HTML is not really a programming language as much as it is a way to structure documents. It's a formality for structuring them. Now, HTML as a markup language includes 142 special elements, which you can use to enclose, wrap, or mark up different parts of the content to make it appear or act in certain ways. The simplest example of a, uh, an HTML element is what I'm showing there on the right-hand side. If I wanted to display on a web document the string, my cat is very grumpy, well, the easiest way to do that would be to wrap this in what's called a paragraph tag, which appropriately uses the word P. And you can see that these, these tags uh, are always starting and ending with a triangle bracket, and that there's an opening version of the tag and a corresponding closing version of the tag that encapsulates the content that I'm interested in displaying within this greater element. What distinguishes the opening tag from the closing tag, as you can see, is this slash on the closing tag, which is not present on the opening tag. So that on the right-hand side is the simplest instantiation of some HTML markup. Now, one of the really neat things about HTML is that you can do something called nesting, where you can take uh, one set of tags and you can sort of apply them within another set of tags. So for instance, if I had that very same sentence, my cat is very grumpy, I may want to uh, emphasize or bold the word very in that sentence. And the way you would do that is by, by wrapping the word very here in a strong tag, as you can see here in the example. Now there are some assumptions that HTML makes about the way that tags are uh, interacting with one another. And more specifically, they want tags to be perfectly nested. That is to say that this top example in gray is the correct way to nest HTML elements, while the bottom example is an, exa is an incorrect way to nest the HTML elements. You know this because um, one set of tags is not perfectly contained within the other. Notice that P starts here and it ends here. And then strong overlaps, but is not perfectly contained within the P or vice versa. So when we talk about nesting of HTML elements, you want to make sure that your nesting occurs like what you see on the top here and not what you see on the bottom here. Now, there's some minimal structural requirements when you're creating an HTML document because um, what I showed you there with the P tag opening and closing, that's really a piece of HTML. It's not an HTML document. What I'm showing you there on the right-hand side is a very bare bones, most simple, most straightforward version of an HTML document. Okay, You could put that uh, into an HTML file, open it in your web browser, and you would see a web page. So at its simplest, it has really four parts. Okay, The first part is this um, doc HTML. Okay, That's this first part. And what this does is, for historical reasons, it sort of tells the browser that the document type of, of, of what's, what's going to follow. So 
what you're about to see browser is an HTML document. That's all this line is trying to communicate. After this, we have a uh, HTML tag, right? So here's where it starts on that second line. And then you can see at the bottom of the document, it ends there. And this is meant to wrap all the content on the page that you want to be interpreted as HTML content. Now, within this HTML tag, this area, there are two sections, right? There's this thing called a head, and then there's a thing called a body. Well, the head is what contains everything that is important for your page, but you don't necessarily want your users to see. For example, you can see within the head, we have this thing called a title. This title is actually what controls the name of the tab on your web browser when you're visiting a page. So if you go to, um, for example, google.com, there will be a tab on Chrome or Firefox or your web browser, and that tab will have a name on it. Your browser actually uses this title information to get that. So it's not content on your web page per se, right? It doesn't show up on google.com, but it's content that is useful for some other things. And there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into head that we're going to be covering in a lot of detail later in the lectures. The second component here is the body. Okay, this contains all the content that's displayed on the page. So, you know, in the in the case that we're showing here, this is strong, is the content that we'd want to display when people visit the page, which is distinct from obviously the title of the page that shows up in the, the tab of the web browser. Now, we're going to be going through a lot of these HTML elements. Remember, I said there's 142 of them earlier on the slides. And the way for you to get your head around the HTML elements is to really think of them as two categories. Okay? There are block level elements and there are inline level elements. Okay? A block level element is purely structural, it's supposed to take the page and break it into chunks. Practically, what this means is that if you have a block level element, it's sort of above it and below it. When you define it, there will be some kind of white space or line breaks that partition it from other parts of the content. It's meant to be structurally separate from other things. That is distinct from these inline elements, okay? where you want to, for example, as we showed earlier, style something like make the word this bolded. Um, but you don't want to break it, create a new line, and add some white space above and beneath it. You want it to sort of flow with the text, okay? So that's an example of what an inline element is. And if you if you have those two high-level understandings of you know what the difference is really between an inline element and a block-level element, that's going to be good because you're going to see inline and block show up not only in conversations about HTML, but in CSS and in other places. Now, the reality, of course, is that HTML has significantly more categories than just block and inline. And what I'm going to do is I'm showing you on the right hand side here the various tags and their corresponding high level category on the left. You don't need to understand all of these tags. I'm going to take you through in the lectures which tags are going to be necessary for the class. And in my opinion, for 80 to 95% of everything you're going to want to do in HTML. But I do want to show this to you so that you have at a high level here at the start an understanding of the kinds of structural properties that HTML can control. So the first one is metadata content, which sets up things about the behavior or relationship of the document with other documents. We actually saw an example of this in the very simple uh, uh, web document that we looked at a couple slides ago, right? You can see title here on the right controls something about what shows up in your browser tab. There's also sectioning content which defines things about um, chunks of content on your screen that you want to functionally group together. There's heading content, which helps define the hierarchical structure of your content. Think larger um, blocks, more important blocks that like title your document versus um, subsection headers and so on. There's things that help control the flow of elements that are used in the body of the document. There's a whole lot of these, again, subset of which we will be going through together. There's things that help control in the, in the text of the document, um, performing markup and uh, editing and styling of that content. 
We saw an example of that with strong, like you can see down here, and there's many others. And then, of course, there's certain um, categories of HTML tags that allow us to integrate with uh, external scripts, like JavaScript, that we'll be covering in a couple of weeks. Uh, there are tags that help with embedding content, like images, audio, video, all things that we'll be covering uh, in later components of this lecture. And then there are things that allow for interactivity of content, like when you hover your, uh, your mouse over a, a link, the link changes color, right? That's because there are certain HTML tags that allow for that interactivity. And finally, the last two here are form-associated elements. Like if you want to sign into Google, right, there's a form. If you want to, um, if you want to uh, basically purchase something on Amazon or from Domino's Pizza or anywhere else, you have to fill out a form of some kind. And so there's a, a set of elements that are used to help create and structure and uh, govern those forms. And last but not least, there's these things called sectioning routes, um, which effectively allow you to have um, self-contained uh, outlines within other outlines. So if you want a block, for example, of your document that is governed by its own set of rules within another document with a higher order set of rules, it allows you to do that. You don't need to understand, again, all of these things. The point uh, of this last couple slides was to give you a very high level, a 10,000 foot view overview of what are the kinds of things that HTML can do and what are some of those, those tags and what do they look like? OK, so let's jump back now to just introducing HTML and some of its components. So within HTML, all the examples that we saw um, had an opening tag and a closing tag, right? So the P, for example, you can see here on the example in gray on the right, there's an opening tag. And then we have this is a, this is a paragraph with a line break. And then we close it. But notice that here in the middle, there's actually a, another tagged element called HR. Okay? And what this HR actually does, as I'm showing on the bottom, is it creates a line break followed by a straight line that spans the width of the page. Well, what's interesting about HR, as you can see here, is it's, it's an empty element in the sense that it, it doesn't really encapsulate anything. It just signifies that we want to do something functionally on the page, in this case, drawing a line. So it's important to know that there are some elements within HTML that are like this. They are uh, empty elements. They don't have an end tag necessarily. HR is an example that I'm showing here. There's also one called BR that creates line breaks. And we'll go through and call out um, uh, these different empty elements as we go through the rest of the lecture. So one of the things that's really nice about HTML, if you understand now what a tag is, remember they have an open and they have a close, as you can see here. Well, these HTML tags, you can, within the opening piece, as you can see here, you can put an attribute on the tag. So you put a little bit of white space, and then you can write out a potential attribute. And there's a large set of attributes that are possible on these HTML tags. In the example that I'm showing you here, uh, I've got something called an A tag. Now, an A tag is what's used to create hyperlinks. In this case, I want the text click me to be displayed um, as a link. And the, the particular link I'm interested in is what's specified by this href attribute that you see here. Okay, And so uh, I'm showing you this to basically help make it clear that HTML is not just tags, but really it's tags that can accept certain attributes that you specify within those tags. And that's what makes it really powerful, as we'll come to see soon. OK, as another example, if you wanted to display an image instead of a link, um, an attribute you might use there is called SRC, which stands for source. And if you were to pop this actual line into some HTML code that you wrote, you'd actually see a, a picture of me from my personal website, gassimi.xyz. There are uh, other attributes of, uh, as well that are that are 
pretty neat and important actually, especially when we get to the CSS section of the course, like the style attribute. What you can do with the style attribute is indicate through a, a semicolon separated list, a set of key value pairs that communicate something about what you want to style the text within the tag with. So in this case, you can see I have my opening of the P and it closes here. And within here, I have a, an attribute called style that I use to say I want the color of the text to be red. I want the background to be black and I want to align that text in the center. Okay. And here's the text that's encapsulating it. And as you see here on the right hand side, I get exactly what I had specified by indicating it through this, um, this style attribute. Now, you can do this to style anything in HTML. And we're going to, as we go over HTML, we're going to be including sometimes things in the uh, what's called inline in the HTML itself. In reality, you're not going to really do your styling when you're developing web applications through this style command. You're going to accomplish the same thing using CSS, which is just a way to take that style information and to put it in a self-contained sheet that governs everything about the style of your documents. But showing you it here so that you understand that at its core, um, HTML has tags and those tags have attributes. Now, all the examples I've shown you so far, HTML has one attribute, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. There could be multiple attributes within a given uh, HTML tag. As I'm showing you here on the right-hand side, we have href for that a tag. Remember, this is the link, in this case, to click me. And this link, if I click it, will take me to gassimi.xyz, which is my home page. I also want it so that I give this uh, link a title. What this will do is it will make it so that when I hover my cursor, as I'm showing you there on the bottom, I'll get this nice little pop-up that says more information actually about that, that link. In this case, I want it to say that it's Professor Gassimi's homepage. And finally, I can specify through the target attribute um, some information about whether I want to redirect my current view there or I want to open a new tag. If you want to open a new tab, you use this underscore blank as the value for the target attribute. Okay. There's a couple of things that you should keep in mind when you are having multiple attributes. The common themes are that you always want to have a space between um, the attribute and the element. So notice I don't write a followed immediately by href. There has to be some space here. You can put actually as much space as you want. HTML is very forgiving with white space in general. Um, so you can notice here, for example, I put new lines. I could have not put the new lines. I could have put this all on one line. It also would have worked. Okay. You also, every time you're specifying an attribute, you do want to make sure that you have an equal sign between the attribute and then a open quote that specifies what the content of the attribute is. In this case, uh, you can see in each of the examples, I have uh, a corresponding value of the, of the attribute that we've already discussed. As you go through HTML, you're going to also notice that sometimes the attributes don't have the equal sign followed by some value. Okay, So I've given an example actually there on the right-hand side where I have a input tag. That's what creates inputs on a form, by the way, as you can see down here. This is like a, an empty box that I could type some text into. And I've got it twice, right? I've got an input, I've got a line break, which we went over, and then I've got another input specified something and through the attributes about the type of this input, meaning, hey, I want people to put text in here. But then notice that in the top box, which is grayed out down here, I've disabled it. And in the bottom box, I've not done that. Well, this disabled, there's no equals followed by anything, right? When you see something like that, it's called a Boolean attribute. Okay, And this is because the presence of the attribute itself communicates something about the functionality you want. In this case, you want to disable the box. So because HTML uses some special characters, we've seen this left bracket show up. We've seen a right bracket show up, quotes, single quotes, ampersand, white space, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to actually achieve those in typographically in your content, 
you have to use what's called a character reference equivalent. Okay, these are special codes that are meant to represent the characters. And the HTML parser, basically, if it sees the sequence of characters ampersand LT, followed by a semicolon showing up in, in, the, in your content, it will, at the time of rendering, translate it into this left triangle bracket, as an example. Okay, So this is a long-winded way of me saying, you can, um, you can uh, use, obviously, all of these special characters within your content, but um, just be aware or cognizant to the fact that uh, there are these character references for some of the reserved attributes. Now, finally, HTML, like other languages, has a way to provide comments. And the way that you provide a comment is like what I'm showing here on the right-hand side. You open up uh, a bracket. It looks like a tag, right? So you open up um, the left side of a tag. You put an uh, exclamation mark followed by two dashes. You then put the content of your comment. In this case, I've commented out a paragraph, I am. And then you conclude the comment by being two dashes followed by the end bracket, the end triangle bracket here. OK, so in conclusion, HTML defines the meaning and structure of web content. It's not a programming language. It's a markup language. Uh, HTML elements are cool because you can nest them within each other, as we showed earlier. You can place a strong within a P, or you can place um, uh, uh, emphasis within a P, or and so on. And at the high level, there are two categories of elements in HTML. There are block level, and there are inline level. Inline operates on things uh, within a line. It doesn't create any line breaks. Block level kind of separates the content out into structural blocks. Some elements consist of a single tag, an empty tag, as we showed. The image example, um, the A tag uh, is not an example of that. But... And typically, when you have those single tags, like HR or BR, they're used to insert or embed something in the document. 